Welcome to The How of Business with your host, Henry Lopez, the podcast that helps you start, run, and grow your small business. And now, here is your host. Welcome to this episode of The How of Business. This is Henry Lopez, and my guest today is David Siegel. David, welcome to the show. Uh, Good afternoon. It's uh, nice to be here. (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) Looking forward to this conversation. We're chuckling as I just had a silly technical issue on my side, and David's being very patient with me. But on this episode, David and I are going to chat about how to avoid partnership or founder disputes that could potentially ruin your business. To receive more information about the How of Business, including links to the show notes page for this episode, and how you can continue supporting my show and receive exclusive content and discounts through a Patreon membership, please visit thehowofbusiness.com. So David Siegel is an attorney and partner with Grellis Shaw LLC. Grellis Shaw is a full-service boutique law firm with a focus on startups, technology, and venture law, as well as complex business litigation. David is an accomplished startup lawyer and litigator who has extensive experience in handling a broad range of corporate, transactional, and intellectual property matters, including work on multi-million dollar financings and acquisitions, all in addition to having a deep expertise in handling complex intellectual property, corporate, and commercial litigation matters. He's also, of course, has extensive experience working with business startups. David lives in Santa Clara, California. Once again, David Siegel, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. So as we were chatting before I started recording, you have an interest that I thought was interesting in music and singing in particular. So, and in particular, a certain type of singing. Tell me about that, if you would. Yeah, uh, my, uh, you know, free time, I I guess my big activity is singing uh, mostly 17th and 18th century um, choral music, uh, which I've been doing for, well, for years now, Lord, (laughs) probably (laughs) longer than I want to (laughs) say. And I did, I did a brief search on it because I didn't quite know what it was, but this was uh, commonly back then the music that was used to help uh, communicate the messages in the Bible. I'm crudely explaining it, but but give me a better definition of what this music was for originally. A, a lot of the music is, yes, it is church music, um, which uh, is not a part of how I got involved in it, but um, it is just, you know, the music of that era. There, were, there was secular music as well, but um, most of the major works are are religious in nature and a, a lot of it was performed in in church as mm-hmm. part of you know normal liturgy interesting fascinating all right so let's um let's shift though and talk about <laughs> why i have you here today which is the legal matters related to partnership disputes but i thought I, as i usually do when i chat with attorneys is just do a quick disclaimer if you would David, on on what you're sharing here today, and that it's not direct legal advice. If you could share that with us, please. Yeah, of course. You know, as a lawyer, you know, uh, anything here would not be um, actual legal advice. You know, if you have a legal issue you need to discuss, you know, reach out to a lawyer. Um, uh, Any audience getting involved in uh, starting their own business, I think, is is you know smart enough um, to realize this, but it's important to point out just in case. Agreed. Excellent. All right, so let's let's get in it. Uh, you've seen a lot of issues or a lot of things that lead up to founders or partners getting crossways, and and as I've mentioned in the opening, I've seen it. You've seen it more than I, where that can ruin a business. Certainly, it can ruin people's lives. It can get very emotional and and end up very badly. Um, so let, let's start talking about that. What 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 are your? Let's. I thought I would work through it sequentially. Be as I'm starting to think about starting a business with someone else, what are the, some of the things that you usually give guidance on that people need to think about? And then eventually we'll talk about in a moment, boiling down to an operating or partnership agreement. But what are some of those critical areas that you often advise on? Sure. I, and I, to some extent, this depends on whether I'm speaking to a founder as representing the founder or speaking to right. the business as representing mm-hmm. the business. Um, but there is one thing I would say both sets of advice share, which is what is the exit strategy here? Um, it's 
it's a lawyer is not going to be able to prevent two people from disagreeing down the road. That's just the nature of the world. Um, a lawyer can help set up processes and a lawyer can help set up a, an organized way to get through a dispute such that the business can continue after it. Um, but it's important at the outset to start thinking about, and I hate to call it worst case scenarios, but that is what it is. What, yeah. what happens down the road if, if, if things don't go the way everyone's hoping? Yeah, yeah. No, great points there that I want to explore here for a moment. The the concept of starting with an exit strategy, I think you're hearing people more and more now, David, talk about this because so many people are advising it. But but it's it's I mean, I'm guilty of it where I've gone into businesses where it wasn't we we don't even talk about we're gonna have this business forever, I guess. I don't know. We we hadn't thought about it, right? Uh, right? but it's so critical to think through it, particularly from the perspective of the impact on the partnership if I have one idea and you have another as to where we're going to go with this longer term. Right. And, and you know, there, there are the, there's kind of the soft issues and the hard issues. And, and there's, you know, I will say on that, on that note that there is legal documentation and legal decisions that get made, but part of thinking through how to minimize the risk to the business and the founders over the course of the life of a business is actually documenting things beyond the legal. Um, and, you know, uh, it's always, lawyers are mainly there for legal advice, but, you know, we deal with a lot of, you know, companies and there's a bit of business advice that always kind of creeps through, but charting out with each other, what you see as the, what, where this business is going, what your, what the strategy for it is, um, what your kind of expectations of time and other things are, if you're, you know, are, are you know, oftentimes entrepreneurs are working a full-time job and starting a company, it, you know, it's good to have as much, you know, out in the open at the beginning to avoid problems down the road. Yeah. It, and not to get ahead of, of our conversation yeah. here, but, but that is also something that, as you mentioned it, that's so important to do on a periodic basis. And like you said, get the input of an attorney. Because what I have found is what we it, it's important to have that conversation now at the beginning, but mm -hmm. man, things change dramatically in individuals' lives and perspectives as you get into the business over time, right? Uh, all the time, whether whether you think it's going to happen or not, that oh, will it changes happen. <laughs> absolutely. It will happen, and so we don't want to. We want to hopefully, to your point, I, if I was hearing you right, is continue to also get that counsel and have these conversations so that you hopefully can avoid it getting completely crosswise with each other as you as things change, right? Um, but other points that you made, the worst case scenario point, I think that's such an important one, David, because what I find is we're typically in that honeymoon phase of the business up front. We can't possibly imagine that you and I who have been best buddies forever are ever gonna get uh, crosswise, we're ever gonna disagree on anything. And so, and we also, I think we have a tendency to avoid having those discussions about what could go wrong, right? That is correct. And, you know, one of my uh, strategies for kind of grounding that is to start talking in, in specifics. So most of the time when I'm talking with entrepreneurs or founders, if I start getting into, okay, how would you feel about your co-founder incurring a million dollars in debt for the business without your approval? Would that mm -hmm. be okay? Mm -hmm. Once I start talking about specific types of things that could happen and how decisions get made, um, people are usually willing to start thinking more long-term and more going back to worst case scenario, yeah. um, but you know, in, in a more kind of objective way. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, I, and again, that's a great example of that where, again, an attorney can help us think through those scenarios. Uh, but we have to resist that push back to say, well, you know, you're just being an attorney and thinking of everything that can go wrong <laughs> and it's never going to happen. But it does happen. It happens almost every single time. Because, again, usually what we end up having are very superficial uh conversations with the assumption 
A, that we have read each other's minds on all of these particular points, and B, that we're not, things aren't going to change over time, yeah? Right, and, and that's, that is pretty typical. Um, that's not the way, and I understand why it's not the way, it, it's hard to, to start a business and put in your life and your resources and at the same time, think about the bad things that could happen. Right. So that's what lawyers are for. Yep. Um, it doesn't have to dominate, you know, your time and energy. It's a set of conversations, a set of documentation, and then you focus on your business. You, that's that's the way it should happen. Yeah. Well said. Well said. What are your thoughts on 50-50 partnerships? So two people coming together and we're going to own it 50-50 equity-wise. So the first thing I always think think about in talking to clients about 50-50 partnerships, which are, in some situations, they're unavoidable. Um, one thing to keep in mind is disaggregating economics and control. So the, you can make a decision to have 50-50 economic interest in the company without having 50-50 control. Okay. Um, those are not the same, those are not the same decision. Um, and that sometimes changes the way people think about things. But the reality is a lot of the time when people think of themselves as equal owners of the potential business going into it, it's hard to separate out control and 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 economic interests. Am I a fan of it? No, from a legal perspective, it makes everything more complicated. Um, but it's not really my job to say to, to say one of you has to be the controlling person here and one has to be the um, minority, you know, shareholder or interest holder, you know, if, you know, if that's what the two people need to move forward, then it's my job to help with that. There are various types of things that should be put in place with a 50-50 partnership, but the big, going back to the exit strategy, there there has to be a way out without ruining the business. Mm -hmm. um, unless the two agree that what should happen if there's a dispute is that it should dissolve. That's rarely what people want. Right. It's rarely the best thing to happen. There has to be a kind of all-purpose way out. And, and you're, are you alluding to some type of buy-sell clause when you say way out? Yes. Okay. Um, okay. All right. We'll dive into that in a moment, but, but, but it's interesting your thoughts there. I, I agree. My personal preference when I've done, in fact, I've, uh, I don't think I've ever done a 50-50 <laughs> partnership. Um, and for my clients, I always advise, as you just said, to think about it very carefully uh, before doing so, although I've had uh, an, a couple of attorneys tell me, which is interesting to think about, that well, when you're 50 50, you got to make a decision. In other words, you know, so it's you got to, it almost forces you to have to agree to move forward, but that's easier said than done. But thank you for those thoughts um, on, on that. So let's, let's dive into buy sell. It can get very complicated. Would you just at a high level? in somewhat layman's term, explain what we mean by a buy-sell clause. Sure. Um, it, it's kind of a broad concept where, and it doesn't have to be in a 50-50 situation, but that's kind right. of the easiest to explain it, is um, some mechanism for, if you have partner A and partner B, um, for based on one or more different types of triggers to force one of those partners to buy out the other, or... Um, it could be the reverse, the force. It could be either forcing you to be bought out or forcing you to buy out the other one. And or, or it could just be a for, right of first refusal as well. Right? It could be that as well. There, it, it can be, it's kind of a broad concept. Yep. Um, with a 50 50 partnership, my preference is to have some mechanism for. Well, let me take a step back. There's there buy sell agreements often deal with situations like where there's some sort of involuntary transfer, like is partner A and partner B, and let's say partner B gets divorced and some portion of partner B's interest goes to their spouse, um, in or partner B goes bankrupt and their interest in the company is going to go to someone else. Having some mechanism for partner A to buy out any involuntarily transferred interest is often a part of a buy sell. Mm -hmm. agreement but 
Um, with a 50-50 partnership, I'm more focused on the idea that there should be, if there's um, a fundamental dispute or deadlock, a way for A to buy out B or B to buy out A so that the business can continue. Right. And those triggers, again, kid, uh, again, whether it's 50-50 or not, because I, I, I believe and I've had in every single partnership agreement, at least in recent history, some sort of a, of a buyout clause, even when it hasn't been 50-50. But you mentioned some of those triggers. Somebody could get divorced. Somebody could die. Somebody could become incapacitated. Um, all of those things could be things that, quote unquote, trigger whatever it is, however it is that we've set up this buyout opportunity, right? Right. And it can then just be because of a deadlock is the other. Right. Um, now, one of the approaches which we actually have used a couple of times is what I guess colloquially or slang has been called the shotgun clause. Um, what are your thoughts on that approach? And then perhaps if you could just explain it at a high level what that is. Yeah. Uh, so it, it's, I've found the most common way people approach um, particularly the deadlock kind of buyout where, um, let's say partner A, uh, and there, there are variations on this, but the basic idea is partner A invokes the clause, then partner A says, gives a number, let's say, you know, I'll buy you out for $500,000. And then partner B has a choice of either accepting that offer or buying partner A out for $500,000. It's right. kind of like the parable about, you know, two people trying to divide something up and person A decides how it's to be split and person B gets to decide who gets which part. Right. Right. Because what that keeps me, so if I'm partner A and I come to you and say, I'm going to give you 500,000, David, for, to buy you out. If I lowball you, if that's my strategy, well, you can turn the tables on me and buy me out at that low ball price. Right. Right. That, and that's, that's the logic behind it. And that's the logic. It's a strong logic. Yeah. However, if you come to me regardless of what price and I just am not in a financial position to buy you out, yes. then I have a uh -huh. disadvantage, right? That is that is the probably the most common criticism and, and one I subscribe to for shotgun clauses is it, it does benefit one partner with resources over a partner without resources. And if neither partner has resources, then it isn't a particularly effective and equitable way to kind of allow people to walk away. Yeah. Um, so it's not the only mechanism. It's it, not. It, yeah. Yeah. Because let's talk about that. But the challenge though, is in a, in a, a buy sell clause, that doesn't have that provision that so typically then yeah, I certainly have the provision of a right of first refusal. Right. So explain sure. that if you would. Yeah, a, a right of first refusal is uh, where if one person wants to transfer their interest in the company, then the other partner has the right to step in and buy the selling partner's interest on the same terms they were going to sell to a third party. Right, right. Um, and this is all about keeping the shares or equity interests of a company within the one could say the family of people who are actually running it as opposed to, you know, a larger company where you have third, you know, outside investors in, in a lot of small businesses, particularly in a lot of businesses at the beginning and small businesses in particular, the equity owners, the owners of the business are the people running it. You're not, you know, giving away to random third parties. Right. Yeah. Yeah. What we've done, for example, related to that is have as part of the clause that if they, especially depending on what position they were in, but if they were in an economic interest only, then if they transfer their shares, that new member, in the case of an LLC, also remains in an economic interest only. They don't have an active participation in the business. So in the right. case of a divorce, that now you're, I'm not in business with your wife, but now your wife owns half of your shares or your units. Uh, she doesn't get to come into the business or he doesn't get to come into the business, right? So we want to control that, right? Right. And that and that's very common. A well drafted operating agreement for an LLC in particular, you know, specifically will provide that if outsiders get an interest in in equity membership interests in the company, that those become non-voting interests of like economic interests as you as you state. Yeah. 
other than the shotgun clause where one party states the value or where I have the right of first refusal or the way it's supposed to work is my understanding is if I'm the one that's trying to sell my, my interest, I have to have gotten an offer that then I bring to you and you can buy me out at that same offer. Other than that, in other situations, what's your recommendation and thoughts for how we value my interest in the business? Sure. I mean, there's, there's kind of two other strategies. One is the, the outside valuator, I, whether, and there are so many structures for getting a third party valuation and, and resolving third party valuations. So that's one. The other is kind of the auction method where, mm. you know, they, you know, they're bidding, you know, against each other to come to a number. In either of these cases, you know, there are various ways of avoiding the kind of the issue of who has the economic resources. Oftentimes, we'll deal with that to an extent by pre-negotiating when, as part of the buy-sell agreement, a payment over time for any of these buyouts. I see. Um, yeah. With, you know, a pre-agreed upon terms at the beginning. Um, and of course, you, you can also have a uh, provisions to allow the buyer to obtain financing. Mm. It, all this is more complicated and takes more time, right? But it does usually lead to a better eventual result. Do you see um, just to go to, on a tangent here? Do you see sometimes that we may not have added that layer of complexity in the initial agreement, but might have come together and agreed to amend uh, our agreement to provide for those provisions later? What are your thoughts there? I mean, of course, later would mean everybody would have to be in agreement, right? Yeah. So, um, yes, the the answer is that does happen, but that has to be at the right time and before there's a real falling out. Yeah, because otherwise <laughs> you're not going to get agreement. It's you're not going to get agreement ugly. on anything. Yeah. It's just going to get uglier. Yeah. Okay. I had oh, and I remember the other thought that, that I've often used as far as a trigger when there is a death is we've included it. And, and here recently, what we did uh, for life insurance is we put in a provision that was only after the business attained a certain amount of value. And I forget how we, what the formula was to calculate that. In other words, we didn't want to have the burden of carrying the policy from day one, but sure. it kicked in, I think, like two years later. What, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it depends. That depends on the business. It would be, it, it's onerous to have that kind of obligation at the, right. at the very beginning right? Um, for, for obvious reasons. You know, there's um, limited resources. So having that spring in either after revenue goals are met or after a particularly a particular period of time is a smart move. And that way it's already in the document. In other words, it's yes. in our agreement. We don't have to now uh, agree to go get this policy. We agreed to it ahead of time. Just a matter as to when we when. executed on it. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. We've touched on, you know, 50 fifties. We've touched on quite a bit here now on the buy sell agreement. What other clauses might come to mind, David, especially related to avoiding hopefully a partnership going bad. Is there, are there other clauses that come to mind that you want to talk about? I, yes. And and one of the one of the most important ways to keep a partnership from going bad is to button up other issues because what and, and I'll get to what I mean by that. But what you don't want to have happen as part of a partnership dispute is giving one partner some sort of leverage because of an unrelated issue. So, mm. for example, if the if the two partners, or let's say it's two, haven't adequately memorialized the terms of their equity interests, or haven't adequately memorialized their assignment of IP into the company, mm -hmm. that gives one that gives one or the other partner leverage against the business. Right, and that is not usually helpful in terms of having an efficient resolution because instead of in, instead of disputing how you're going to buy out the other or, or you know, hopefully that's pre-planned and all that, you're now also adding in disputes over, well, what do we have to pay the leaving partner to assign their IP or mm. to memorialize whatever interest they're going to have because it's not memorialized in the first place. So that is, it, it's kind of, 
seems like a tangent, but it, it ends up being critical because a lot of these partnership disputes end up being about something else. Something else, yeah. And I can see, you know, so I want to explore the whole IP since, since you brought that up as an important point and how that, that happens. I, I've seen where that happens where, you know, we're, we, we started developing stuff before we've actually formed a legal entity or have a partnership or operating agreement. We kind of rush through that and we'll clean this stuff up later. But then later, now this IP <laughs> that I that I own is much more valuable to me is the point in part that you're making, right? Exactly. And you end up debating over what is it that I need to pay this other person to assign IP that everyone understood was going to be owned by the business. Right. You're, 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 it's a payoff for no purpose other than the fact that the parties are now disputing. However, explain, if you will, why that ends up happening, because if people are if we've come together loosely and we start developing stuff, who owns it is what comes into play here. Right. Right. And generally, I mean, there's different IP law broadly, you know, the the person who creates IP is generally the owner, unless there's something that varies that, um, whether it be a written agreement or. There are, you know, implied licenses and the like, but nobody wants, you know, nobody wants to rely on fuzzy provisions that leave, you know, a cloud over a company's IP, you know, if it's an IP focused business, this, this doesn't impact every business the same way. Right. Um, though I will say, if, you know, more, you know, when you talk about IP, you're not just talking about things like patents and, you know, trademarks sure. and copyrights, right. you're also talking about um, confidential information. So mm -hmm. It's a rare business that doesn't have some confidential information. Has Great. everybody signed confidentiality provisions? Or are you worried that your partner is going to go flutter off and put confidential information about the business on the internet because they're not bound to do anything different? Yeah. Or they might have gotten an offer by from somebody else to, hey, be part of the business, but come help us start this in Florida. And we'll, we'll you course. know, it's two separate businesses. Yeah. Yep. So, so I think I read about it in one of your blogs at, at your website about having even before we formalize the the legal entity to have I, I think you refer to them as contractor agreements. But explain what, what what can we do initially as we start working together, but before we've formalized everything. Yeah, I mean, you can do there, there's various things you can do. You can um, you can certainly have an NDA. I mean, that's that's easy yep, between absolutely. people. That's the yep. easiest thing in the world, but. You can have a founder's agreement of some sort, or it, it can be, I mean, you don't even need, you can have a partnership agreement without an entity because wow, you can have point. a general partnership by law. But I'll be quite honest, the the easiest thing in the world now is creating a legal entity. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, in the past, that was an expensive thing to do, but now, and, and every dollar counts, uh, I, I don't mean to be flip about it, but um, the reality is it's it's very easy to create an entity that IP can be assigned into. I see. Um, so just for that purpose, even if it's even if we don't have our complete formal operating and partnership agreement, because that can be lengthy and yes. much more expensive. You're saying, you know, go form the entity. Heck, I could do it myself in the state of California exactly. for a couple hundred bucks yep. and then have agreements in place that at least assign the IP to that entity. Yep, that's the it's the cheapest it's the cheapest way to get the IP owned by something. Yes. Anything else is going to be more um, have to be more customized and it'll just be more expensive. Understood. Great, great advice there. This is Henry Lopez briefly pausing this episode to invite you to schedule a free coaching consultation with me. I welcome the opportunity to chat with you about your business plans and offer the guidance and accountability that we all need to achieve success. As an experienced small business owner myself, I understand the challenges you're experiencing, and often it's about helping you ask the right questions to help you make progress towards achieving your goals. Whether it's getting started with your first business or growing and maybe exiting your existing small business, I can help you get there. To find out more about my business coaching services and to schedule your free coaching consultation, please visit thehowofbusiness.com. Take that next step today towards finally realizing your business ownership dreams. I look forward to speaking with you soon. All right, let's talk about, you also talk about, um, again, I, I probably read it on, on your blog. You all, you all have a, a great blog at Grella Shaw's website. It's grellas.com. 
and I'll have a link to it on the show notes page for that. A lot of great information there, but that's where I read about the potential issues related to capitalization. And so I'd like you to introduce us to that concept and what, what are we talking about there that could be an issue? Yeah. So this all deals with the concept of what people call piercing the corporate veil. So right. the idea is when you're creating an entity, a limited liability entity, so we're talking about LLCs, corporations, uh, limited partnerships, is that the owners of the entity are not supposed to be liable for the debts of the entity itself. It's one of the main reasons to create an entity is to kind of protect the owner's personal assets. Mm -hmm. um, but that protection is not, uh, you know, a foolproof protection. Um, and basically, the high level idea here is the law doesn't want to allow you to defraud creditors by creating an entity to shield the owners from liability. And there's different ways that so when the when a creditor can go beyond a corporation or an LLC and and sue the owners directly for the entity's debts, it's called piercing the corporate veil. One of the main ways that happens is if the business is not, as one would say, adequately capitalized. And the idea here is, do you create a business with a lot of potential liability, foreseeable liability, and not have any assets in the built in the business to satisfy those liabilities. Mm -hmm. And is that often sometimes referred to in, in this application as a shell company that's used just for that purpose of defrauding a potential creditor? Yes, okay. it, it is. Uh, and and there are there are shell companies that are completely valid that are legit, and, they're, they're, yeah. and yeah. that are legit. And there's this right. kind of shell company. Mm -hmm. So the idea here is, you know, I don't want to say it's exactly that a creditor would have to prove intent, but it's not just the matter of the business not having enough money. There has to be some element of creating the business for the purpose of shielding mm -hmm. people from liability. And and I, I don't want to scare people over this. It's not the idea that at all times you look, does the company have enough money? Does the company have enough money for its debts? This is, you're looking at the time of formation. Right. Um, because this is an intent issue. Obviously, companies um, sometimes can't satisfy its debts down the road. Yeah, and can get happen. upside down. And so that's perfectly yes. okay. Is yeah. there a rule of thumb then, David, initially as to what, you know, what, because this is, and the piercing of the veil happens in a court of law, if I, if I understand correctly, you're right? Correct. A yep. judge determines based on the evidence. Yep, you're right. You can go after the personal assets. So is there a kind of rule of thumb on what the capitalization needs to be? There's not a number. What there is, is it's supposed to be in light of what would reasonably be expected to I be see. the liabilities. And important in this is just documenting how you're making that decision. And also important in this is to realize we're not just talking about, you know, taking the million dollars in your bank account and putting it into the business in case you don't have a million dollars. Other things count, like, do you get business liability insurance? That's a huge, mm, important thing to do. Get business liability insurance, not just to protect the business, but to protect yourself to show, because that's a way of capitalizing a business. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I didn't think about that. All right. Excellent. Great, great advice there. And again, you know, obviously at the end of the day there, you got to get advice from a CPA and, and possibly an attorney as yeah. well on making sure you're doing that the right way. Yeah. Right. That is correct. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for sharing that. I didn't know that much about that. Uh, what are the common mistakes that have we not touched on that you see founders making partners making, especially again, uh, as they're coming into together into business, are there things we haven't touched on that come to mind? The one big one that people should think about is whether or not um, to have a vesting arrangement for mm. ownership of equity. Okay. Yep. So the idea here is even if you're splitting up 50, 50 or one third, one third, one third, whatever it happens to be, do the owners own outright at the beginning, or do they have to kind of earn the equity by working for the business over time? And it can be a difficult conversation at the beginning, but let me tell you that it is not that uncommon in a partnership or, or founder dispute where there is no vesting for one of the 
entrepreneurs or founders, partners to who, let's say, owns 50% and there was no vesting to say, all right, I'm just going to go and get another job and do other things. And I own half this company and there's nothing you can do about that. Um, if the intent is that the owners work for the business, then that has to be incorporated somewhere. And one of the key ways of doing that is just vesting over time. Right. This is an interesting point. I have always understood and used vesting when there's sweat equity being acquired, but you're saying even if we came in 50, 50, would each put 50% of the money that even in that case, there is a vesting schedule in case, as you just described, three months into it, I decide, okay, I, I'm bored. I'm going to go do something else or whatever the case might be. Yeah. That, I, that would keep me engaged for a period of time, actively involved in the business. Now, yeah. can I not achieve the same thing though, by spelling out what my roles are in the partnership or operating agreement, or is just that just not very enforceable? It can be enforceable, but I mean, it's only enforceable be... to the degree that I say, well, I'm going to stop paying you a salary, but I, but I can't take your interest. Right. Yeah. I mean, well, yes. I mean, without vesting terms, it's very hard to take right. someone's interest, right. but I've seen, I'm not the biggest fan of partnership or operating agreements that say, X person is responsible for A, B, C, D, and E because it's okay. ultimately going to be subjective. Okay. Okay. And then and then you get into even more disagreement on what we meant and what that means. And, uh, you know, because that that is where there's a lot of, of what essentially happens. Well, I'm putting in more effort and I didn't know this was going to be that much work. And it seems like you're getting rewarded equally, but I'm putting in, I'm the one doing the yeah. hard work and all that happens then, right? Right. And, and that and that's what happens all the time. I okay. mean, exactly. So vesting, even for those who are fully capitalized for their proportion of interest in, in equity. Yeah. And, and let me let me make one note about that. I mean, it, any if if someone's putting in two hundred thousand dollars into a business and they're going to have vesting, it is it is obviously equitable that they get if they get their money back for any unvested portion. Uh, I'm not suggesting someone should put $200,000 into Right, I understand what you're saying. Not, yeah, yeah there, there has to be some fairness. To right, this, I don't but... lose my principal, if you will, <laughs> right? But right. I don't get ownership. Uh, as I only get ownership or, or maintain ownership as it vests according to that schedule. Exactly. So in that case, what the part of the agreement would be is, all right, David, that's fine. Uh, here's your you know $100,000 balance back that is invested. But now you only have, you know, the 25% that's yours that's still right. invested in the company. Exactly. Understood. Understood. Excellent. Thanks for clarifying that. All right. Let's move forward then. And I'm in a bad partnership <laughs> and things are going sideways. What, what, what do you usually do with that phone call when somebody calls you? What's their your first guidance, piece of guidance there? Sure. And I'm assuming here at this point, I'm representing um, a partner and not representing. Yeah. And, and let's, let, let's clarify that because you made that point earlier, which is such a big one. And I think people get very confused about that, especially even early on, David, because I, I know I've had to explain this to various people and, and it's perfectly okay. For example, in our last one, uh, we hired an attorney and he made it very clear. We were all okay that the attorney was representing the entity, the business. We each individually could have gone and gotten our own independent attorney representing us exclusively, right? That's correct. And sometimes there's three attorneys. Sometimes there's, there's exactly, yeah. partner A, partner B, and the company. That's not right. that unusual. That's right. Um, and in some ways, that's that can be the best. Sure. That means everybody is represented, but more expensive. It's yeah. more expensive. <laughs> but to your point, I call you as partner A. I'm the one that has an issue. I'm probably calling you for you to represent me. And therefore, of course, you can't be the same attorney that we hired to represent the business or hire or that represents the other partner. Right, exactly. And, you know, if I'm representing partner A, you know, I have a mandate. So, um, you know, from my perspective, I want to find out what goals are, right? What are we, what are we trying to do here? Um, the, uh, I, I will say a good attorney representing a partner in a partnership dispute, um, assuming 
I'm making some assumption here that when I'm talking about a partnership dispute, I'm talking about a deadlock kind of dispute. Right. Obviously, right. if there's some other issue, someone's defrauding someone mm -hmm. or something, that's a whole different world. But I'm talking about just a partner breakup situation. Yeah. A good yeah. attorney, you know, obviously zealously uh, represents their client, but also has enough experience to know what a reasonable resolution is because it is very rarely good for anyone to litigate these things to end up in court because it's just so expensive and it right. it, it doesn't do any good for the business. It's going to end up um, pop, pop, may possibly end up destroying the business anyway, right? It often does destroy the business, yeah. right? For for various reasons, just yeah. the publicity around it or the costs or the attention being paid. So you know, I want to understand what goals are, but I also want to try to explain what a reasonable resolution is and how we can get there. And the best partnership dispute resolutions from the perspective of, you know, efficient and efficient in terms of time and efficient in terms of cost and, you know, allowing the business to go forward, which can be in both partners' interests, is where I'm able to, you know, talk to the other side's attorney and kind of come up with a resolution because we're able to kind of distance ourselves from the emotions around it. Yeah. Me mediating between the two parties. Yeah. And it might even be that we go to formal mediation. That's in fact a clause obviously that, that I would like to have in my operating or partnership agreement. Right. Absolutely. Having a, I mean, so I have, I, I have mixed feelings about mandatory mediation okay. provisions. Tell me about um, that, please. So uh, for those, I mean, for those who don't know, there's different types of dispute resolution processes outside of court. One of them is mediation, which I'm generally a huge fan of, where basically both sides hire a third party neutral, often an ex-judge, sometimes a lawyer, who helps negotiate a resolution between the parties. It's entirely voluntary to agree to a resolution, but this person is there to help bridge the gap. And in any dispute at some phase mediation makes makes sense i've seen sometimes forced mediation prior to um actually litigating result in a party not who's not ready for it just not actually participating like they'll go but they won't yeah um, grudgingly yeah they're go yeah and then it and then it's ineffective and then it's harder to get another mediation down the road i see so it kind of depends on it to me it depends on the personalities involved mm -hmm. at the outset mm -hmm. if they are personalities that i would think would be amenable to trying to find ways to resolve things just as a general matter then yeah then pre-dispute mediation makes perfect sense yeah um, if they're more stubborn people then i get concerned about it right right okay excellent tip sir thank you for that you mentioned, obviously, and we've talked about finding an attorney. A couple of tips you might have for how do I find a good attorney? Yeah, I mean, first things first, the best, the best way to find an attorney is to talk to somebody you know. <laughs> to get <laughs> talk a to referral, somebody you right? know and get a referral. There are a lot of attorneys out there. Yep. And, you know, you can Google, but what are you going to really, I mean, you read websites. If you're in a situation where you're reading websites, which is fine. I mean, we all do it. You you don't want someone who does literally everything. So if they're doing corporate law and family law and trust in the states and personal injury, that's not, that's not for you. Right. You know, you want someone who concentrates in what, what your legal needs are. Obviously there are firms that do all sorts of things that are larger firms. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about if you're, if it's a small firm with a couple of attorneys, they, they're going to need to specialize. Um, and the other thing is, um, and this depends on your type of business. If you are a business that relies, for example, on outside investment, then you don't want an attorney whose core clients are your investors. Right. That makes sense as well. You know, I, I have uh, one of the challenges, of course, with attorneys is in my experience, most attorneys don't offer a free consultation like most CPAs do. And so it's hard, but I always tell people, you know, if in that first meeting, if it doesn't feel like a connection, you, you, you probably should move on, right? I agree with that. Um, and so that's why a referral or somebody I meet at a chamber uh, or something like that is, is what I always recommend as a way to hopefully connect with them, 
maybe even in a, in a different setting to make sure there's a personality match for you there. Right. I, I agree with that. And yeah, in terms of, you know, I, I found that, you know, all accountants I've ever dealt with CPAs do free, free consultations. Right. Right. Attorneys vary more. We have, we have a hybrid approach at our okay. firm. Okay. Um, Explain that if you would. It, it, so for us, it depends on what the consultation is. So if somebody wants to have a consultation to see if we're a good fit and learn about the firm and things like that, that we don't charge any money for. Okay. Okay. If somebody wants an hour of attorney time to discuss right. substance of whatever their issue and get legal advice, yeah. um, and that might turn into something more in the future, but you know, but it's it's actual substantive legal work, then we do a reduced rate one hour. No, that seems very fair. Both options seem very fair, especially the ability to come in first and make sure that we have a, a connection here that, that, that you were, were, you know, the same types of approach. And so that's, that's, I think, very valuable. I'm glad yeah. And, and do that. For, for some prospective clients, the best way they know how to evaluate whether a relationship is good is to see some legal work being done for a that's little true. while. So right, it right. just, it depends. I mean, there's different, there's different strategies in that perspective yeah. and I respect both ways of all right, yeah. so that's a perfect segue. Tell me yeah. uh, anything else that we haven't chatted about yet about Grelish Shaw. And um, you guys have a great resource page, as I alluded to. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so as a firm, you know, our, our, our core clients are startups and small businesses and founders, entrepreneurs. That's, that's what we do. Um, we do, um, which is, you know, less typical for firms of our size. Um, have are divided half and half into doing more of the corporate and IP side work, and then on the other side, litigation. Um, and I am the one kind of exception at the firm in that I do both. I started at a large firm as a litigator and then came to Grilla Shah and started doing uh, the more corporate side work. I think from a partnership dispute type perspective, having both of those perspectives is um, invaluable because I, I know how things go wrong. Right. So at the beginning, I know how to set things up to try to avoid them going wrong or to minimize the impact of them going wrong. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, in terms of resources, I would say this to anyone. I, I, I'm biased. I fully admit that. But on our website is um, something called the Startup 101 series, which was authored by our the founder of our firm, George Grillis. And um, it's the reason I joined Grillis Shop. Really? Um, before I joined it, I came across that website and read that stuff. And I knew this is a place I wanted to work because I wanted to work with startups and this is the person I wanted to work with. So I highly recommend um, people read that because one of my biggest tips for entrepreneurs is education. I mean, you need good advisors, but you can't blindly hire advisors and trust them to just make decisions for you. You have to be a part of the decision making and part of that decision making is understanding things. And yes, an advisor who can explain things to you in ways you understand is great, but having some background is just, there's no way to um, replace that. Well said. Yeah, we can't just like with, I say that just like with financials, we cannot completely acquiesce that we, oh, I just don't know anything about the law or business. Oh, no, that's not right. a good excuse. We have to, yes, it takes time and you got to keep asking the same questions, but we, we, it is our responsibility as entrepreneurs and business owners to learn and educate ourselves. And then of course, get advice, get legal advice as well. Exactly. Well said. And yeah, and, and, that, and I will attest that I've, I mean, I've been a lot of attorneys websites and this one has an inordinate amount of accessible information including that startup 101 guide we'll have a link to it on our show notes page at the .com. and then related to that david there's a resource uh, book slash resource that that i think you would recommend to us yeah so there's a, a company called clerky that um we really like they as a website as a business what their thing is is they um, provide kind of basic, they'll go, they'll do the process of basic legal documentation, creating a corporation, stock issuances and the like. It's, it's, it's much cheaper than hiring an attorney. And, mm -hmm. and it, it sounds weird, but as an attorney for, for the type of business that's going down a certain path, that's just the efficient thing to do is to yeah. go to a company like Clerky. They have a, um, a startup legal guide, actually it's startup legal concepts for founders, I think it's the official name, and, and uh, I'll get the link over to you, um, which also, I think, goes through a lot of basic principles that that um, entrepreneurs should know. 
um, in, in an accessible way. Wonderful. Thanks for that recommendation. And I'll get that link from you and put it on the show notes page as well. Absolutely. All right, David, we'll wrap it up. What's, what's one thing you want us to take away in summary related to what we've talked about, about hopefully avoiding partnership or founder disputes? What's one thing you want us to take away? Don't shy away from having difficult conversations at the beginning. It's founders and entrepreneurs need optimism, and that's what can get them through you know, late nights and working on weekends and all the things you have to do. But if you spend 2% of your time at the beginning just charting out the just-in-case cases with someone who knows how to do that, you will be better off for it later. Not, I, I hate to say it, not everything is going to go right and having the backup that there's, that there's exit ramps that can keep the business going is in everyone's interest. Completely agree. That, that has been absolutely my experience and the advice that I give. Thank you for, for validating that. I, I think it's so critical and so common that we overlook those things. So thanks, thanks for sharing that. Absolutely. Tell us where you want us to go online to learn more about you and about Grellis Shaw. Yeah, I mean, our website, grellis.com, um, as we've kind of discussed, there's a lot of resources, just generally speaking, but, you know, you can also take a look at, you know, the services we provide and um, the various people we have to, to help you out. And it's G-R-E-L-L-A-S.com, grellis.com. That, that is correct. David, fascinating. I've learned a lot. Thank you so much for being patient with my questions and, <laughs> and explaining to me in terms that I can understand. Uh, you're excellent at that. So thank you so much for being with me today. Thank you for having me. It's been great. This is Henry Lopez. And thanks for joining me on this episode of the How of Business. My guest today again was David Siegel. I release new episodes every Monday morning, and you can find us anywhere you listen to podcasts, including Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and at my website, thehowofbusiness.com. Thanks for listening. Thank you for listening to The How of Business. For more information about our coaching programs, online courses, show notes pages, links, and other resources, please visit thehowofbusiness.com.